We're just trying to change the world here, people. Oh, really? Bad idea. All right, so <clears throat> welcome back to our Really Radio, show 130. Uh, this is recorded still Friday, October 28th, 2016. And we got a couple more things to dismantle for you. Bad ideas. Uh, the, uh, the We mentioned this in show A. Uh, the, the Russians are... Have they've decided to continue to uh, repair their um, their arsenal? So, the RS twenty eight Samrat missile is their latest foray into a a intercontinental ballistic missile. Uh, this one can travel at four point three miles per second and can deliver a forty megaton, uh, I believe it's sixteen warhead uh, yield. Uh, NATO called the missile the Satan II. It's which 15. I find, which I find terribly amusing. 15? Okay, thank you. It was fi 15 Merv warheads. Okay. I actually did a re quick research. We're getting, we're getting once again into my military section where I go, ooh, cool stuff. <laughs> oh, actually... But go on. Actually, I uh, I did a direct copy-paste, and it did say 16 warheads from where I pulled. Oh, okay. So... That's cool, Whatever. It's in the One 15. extra warhead I don't think is going to matter that much. Well, it will to the person it lands on. So, Well, again, the key thing when it came to this that I read mm -hmm. was, again, not for everyone out here, modern intercontinental ballistic missiles do not contain like the old style ones would where it is one rocket, one warhead. Everyone nowadays contains multiple. Uh, again, this new one from Russia contains 15, 16, somewhere out there, something teen. Yeah. <laughs> um, a number. Uh, the standard one that we launch, which is the Peacekeeper 3, um, and the, well, so the, Peace, the Peacekeeper Missile Testing, also the Minuteman, typically yeah. carries about, if I remember correctly, and if I'm wrong, please write in correct me, Yep. Uh, carries eight. Now, each of these tends to be, you know, dialable warheads upwards of 300 kilotons, possibly bigger. What we're seeing here is, from what I've seen from possible uh, explosive capability, is each one of these SR-28 Samurats had a combined somewhere between 40 and 50 megatons of power. Which, to give everybody an idea, the largest bomb ever detonated was a 50 megaton weapon called the Tsar Bomba. It was done by the Russians. And that was at its low power setting. It was capable of a 100 megaton blast, and that was a single weapon. Yeah. Now, now it's multiple, but smaller. Now, you you mentioned the Peacekeeper. So, just a, a real quick look. The LGM-118 Peacekeeper, also known as the MX Missiles for Missile Experimental, um, land-based ICBM deployed by the United States in 1986. The Peacekeeper... Uh, was an MIRV missile that could carry up to 10 re-entry vehicles, each armed with a whopping 300 kiloton W87 warhead. Yeah. Yay. Let's start a new... So, that's 10... New Cold War. That's one missile with 10 little missiles, each with 300 kilotons apiece. Yeah. This is why when we talk about warheads we get a little bit frazzled. We get a little worried because this is one of the just one of those ends a country the size of France. No, no. That was that was the one that Russia just built. No, the the, the, the peacekeeper that we have is yeah. orders of magnitude bigger than that. 300 kilotons each. Let me just carry the carry the one here. That's 3,000 kilotons of force That's 30 from, megaton. from one missile. Which is slightly smaller than theirs, actually. <clears throat> yeah, it's a... Well, is... Is it slightly smaller in, oh, in total? Yeah. Yeah, no, because as the idea, we're rocking upwards of 30 megatons total delivery capability. Their new one is rocking somewhere between 40 to 50 megatons. But, of okay. course, I believe they're carrying more warheads. 16 Great. warheads, yeah. So, six more. Versus the 10. 
Uh, ugly, ugly business. So, but again, also the key thing about this is, I mean, I know people are freaking out about this, but let's look at it in one. There is a bit of saber rattling involved here, um, so that's a, a bit to be able to understand. But let's not let's not you know kid ourselves or anything else like that. Russia has always liked, even Soviet especially, but also modern Russia, has always liked parading its newest, its best, its brightest. Oh, look at this really pretty piece of military technology we've got out. You know, here's, again, this Samaret. Look at it. Isn't it wonderful? Look at all the destruction we can cause. Look how strong Russia is. If you honestly think, and you can look this up, it's on, oh, look, it's publicly accessible information. It's easy to find. Uh, we upgrade our weapon delivery capability on a regular basis, mostly to keep it in full function and up with modern technology, because we don't want to have, I, I can't believe I'm going to use this term, a missile gap. Um, you know, we want to be yeah. able to, if worse comes to worse, we want to be able to hit that button and make sure all of our weapons fire beautifully, perfectly, and the world can end just as God intended. Um, <laughs> nice. But the difference is, again, we spend billions and billions of dollars revamping, re-upping, reconditioning, and making new delivery systems and putting them out there and putting missiles on them. We don't increase our nuclear stockpile, but we make sure our delivery systems are functional. The major difference between us and the Russians in this case is we don't then take that delivery system and then drive it down Pennsylvania Avenue so everybody can see it. Yeah, this would be the saber rattling that they're they're into. They're they're just trying to make some press out of it. Um, at least they are planning on, you know, this is this is a staged upgrade, in theory, you know, as opposed to a stockpiling of, of more, um, because then they'd be in violation of several, you know, nuclear uh, treaties, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. so they want to put these Samrats into service by late 2018 and remove the last of the uh, SS-18 missiles by 2020. So hopefully that. Uh, I suppose the worst that could happen is that they go off accidentally. Again, with and here that's the other thing. People might figure, oh my god, what if it goes off accidentally and everything else? Modern weapons, including Russians, um, more what you would have is not a launch. What you'd have is what you see in the in those wonderful, amazing old videos of the original space program, where it just detonates on the launch pad and the warheads are built to withstand that kind of explosion and pressure and continuous yeah. fire guys i know i have known people who freak out oh my god what'll happen absolutely nothing yeah you'll have fire no radiation and they'll just walk in there to go okay check it make absolutely sure because safety protocols mm -hmm. okay it's fine remove the warhead recondition it put it back on a new missile <laughs> yeah <clears throat> yeah it they, they go through a, a painstaking process to make sure that they blow up only when they're told to Yes. So it's um it's countries like North Korea that we don't know their track record because they don't have a track yeah. record yet. And <clears> they <throat> don't like people to know their track record. record. Yeah. Can you show of, us you know, your safety mechanism for making sure that the nuclear weapon doesn't go off? Oh, we're using hand grenade pins. <sighs> Again, their pro their problem still is to get one to go off correctly at the correct yield. Let's be honest here. They're still working on that stage. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> but yeah, what again, welcome to the wonderful world of stuff that goes on and the public saber rattling versus private saber rattling where the world governments know what we do, but we don't feel the need to parade our nuclear arsenal out in front of the populace to show them how strong we are. No, but you know, maybe well, maybe they did learn <clears throat> from from Kubrick's movies. Mm -hmm. You know. <laughs> What is what use is a doomsday weapon if no one knows that you have it? <laughs> yeah. So it's like, well, we'll just run it down Main Street. Of course, everyone will find it. It was on the news. It was on CNN. What do you want? Yeah. Uh, silence. Shush. Shush. That shush. Like, do you have shush. a rattlesnake over there? I I almost do. I guess I don't know. Let me just mute everything. There we go. Okay. Mute all, all right. the things the show. <laughs> I I probably I probably should have done that earlier, but I'm I'm still going to uh, be on the defense that I'm sick. So there you go. All right. So we're in the home stretch here. Um, 
something new came out of the Vatican. But it's something that they've been planning all year long. Um, this is kind of, you know, uh, this is a definite light side compared to, you know, nuclear prol proliferation. Uh, Catholics are now forbidden from keeping the ashes of cremated loved ones at home or scattering them or dividing them between family members or turning them into mementos. The Vatican has ruled. So uh, ashes must be stored in a sacred place, such as a cemetery, according to instructions disclosed <coughs> at a press conference in Rome on Tuesday. The Vatican document, Ad Resurgum Cum Christo, is dated uh, August 15th and says Pope Francis approved it in March. Uh, the instructions were released before All Souls Day on November 2nd. Uh, when the faithful remember and pray for the dead. I'm glad that they're, you know, going over important, important things. It's uh, it's so critical. You know, we want to make sure that we put those bodies in the ground is basically what they're saying. At a cemetery. At a cemetery. At holy consecrated ground. Yes. Not just any part of land. <clears throat> no, they, they want it to be consecrated ground. Yeah, absolutely. Just and, like regular ground, but um, consecrated. But, yeah, but with a, a higher price tag on it. Yeah. Um, Cardinal uh, Gerard Muller, I think. Yes. Uh, the prefect for the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith reiterated that burial of the dead was preferable to cremation. We come from the earth, we shall return to the earth, he said. The church continues to incessantly recommend that the bodies of the dead be buried either in cemeteries or in other sacred ground. It's interesting, the, uh, the in increase of cremation since it was permitted in 1963. That's only since, since it's been allowed. <clears throat> um... That's, that's interesting. I don't know why. Ashes must be kept in a holy place. Furthermore, in order to avoid any form of pantheistic or naturalistic or nihilistic misunderstanding, the dispersion of ashes in the air, on the ground, or water, or in some other way, as well as the conversation conversion of cremated ashes into commemorative objects is not allowed. Well, there goes my so, dreams of being a tree. Or, you know, Only if you're whole, a uh, Well, no, remember, there's also the whole new thing about taking your loved one's ashes and under scientific conditions and compressing them into a diamond. That's what I was going to do. I was going to turn, turn myself into a diamond. <clears throat> you know, the parts that didn't end up being uh, approved for, for science or whatever, um, convert myself into, into a pair of diamonds so that I can, uh, you know, go to my daughters. That way I can haunt them forever. Ah. <laughs> That's my plan. I'll always be with you. No, really, I will. Always. A pair of you. diamonds <laughs> that go into a painting and the diamonds will be the, the little dots in my eyes. No, I'm just imagining the you know, the whore staring your, at your you. daughter, your daughter on her wedding night. There's a honeymoon suite, and all she hears in the is, "I'm watching you." Like, whoa, <laughs> dad, stop! Not creepy, dad. <laughs> Not creepy at all. Come on, you can do better than that. That's what I would get. You can do better than that. Come on. <laughs> Come on, dad. <laughs> yeah, all sorts of good stuff. So, what what do you think? Is this just another reason to tell the Catholic Church to sayonara, buddy? The Catholic Church, over the last while, has had some has had some definite advances when it comes to social progressiveness. You know, we can all say that they've you know some of their ideas and ideologies, thanks to Pope Francis, a lot of it actually has been very progressive. However, we're dealing with one of the largest and oldest contiguous organizations in the world, run by essentially bureaucrats appointed by God, as far as they're concerned. 
Yeah. Real change and lasting change takes a long time. The fact that we've had the changes we've had since Francis has taken office have been, like, amazing to me. I've been incredibly surprised at that. Like, wow, this is what you get when you throw an Argentinian in there rather than somebody from Poland. Um, You know, (laughs) the standard old guard. You know, you bring in new blood. Yeah. Someone with an outside perspective. But there are still certain key things that are going to, for a long time, it's, you know, if it continues... It'll just be the slow, continual change. Yeah, there'll be about anywhere between 20 to 50 to 100 or more years behind everybody else. You know, but this it will continue to just keep rolling forward and slowly get there. Is it... Do they have their problems? Oh, God, yes. They still have their problems. They've still got their issues. I'm still like, why is this a thing? But... Again, I am hopeful and I'm glad to see that it is not just some organization that has decided to just stick its head in the sand and say, screw modernity, we're doing it like it was back in the 1100s and we ruled everything. So it's nice to see that. David, what do you think? There's the number of Catholics in the world numbers in the billions. Yeah. So, given the number, just the sheer mass of humanity that comprises the Catholic Church, it's not something that's really going to ever go away. And with an organization of that size, like you said, you know, change is really slow. Um, And it can't really be done away with because you just create a power vacuum. And what replaces the Catholic Church if they just one day dissolved could easily be far worse than what we've got. <laughs> Which has made some strides lately to be to his point. Um, is it enough? Uh, is it ever going to be enough? Well, we'll see. Hmm. We'll see. Because, I mean, social progress is something that, that we... We're striving towards a perfection that we'll probably never attain. Um, there will always be more work to do. So they're kind of they're they're one of the anchors for sure. But um, they also do some good while they're at it. So they they do serve a a. Uh, I'm trying to think of the best word here. A they provide consistency in a very insane world. Consistency, and I would say that that's an important thing in times like now, when people are threatening to really upset all the balances of power everywhere. Consistency is a nice generic term. I like that. I like that. Um, For your information, as of 2010. There are nearly 1.1 billion Catholics, up from an estimated 291 million in 1910. Catholics comprise 50% of all the Christians worldwide and 16% of the world's total population. That was in that was in 2010. So <clears throat> eventually, we'll have you know better. Um, I, I would really like the the U.S. Census to be more than every 10 years. Yeah, I could see cutting it down because of cost wise. Not every year, I'd say every five years. Yeah. Or every or better yet, make it actually make it really simple. Oh hi. Ooh, here's where you can get a couple really good things done. One, make elections a national holiday. Two, yes. make the census every four years that occurs on election day. There you go. Three, make voting compulsory. Huh. Oh look, I just solved three problems and cut the amount of money you're gonna have to spend. My God, I should run for office. Oh, something. <laughs> well, I think uh, I think you'd probably get get some very interesting pushback on combining an obligatory census and election at the same time. I think there's going to be some pushback from that. Yeah. You know, speaking of the Catholics, you know mm-hmm. that kind of thing. Interesting. 
you know, what was it, uh, you know, Herod taking the census and everything and all that, even though yeah. that never actually happened based on world history. Anyway, moving right along, I think it's uh, it's time to, to get to the juicy stuff. <laughs> 